Welcome to the Working Preacher Books podcast, a series focused on igniting your curiosity as a preacher and connecting you with the living word. Join me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson, along with Band at the Podcast. As we gain insights and hear stories straight from working preacher authors about proclaiming an authentic word in challenging times. In this episode, we will talk with uh, Shauna Hannon, author of the People's Sermon in the Working Preacher Book series. Shauna, we're so glad to have you here with us. So welcome to the Working Preacher Books podcast. Thanks so much. Great to be here. Good to see you all. So uh, before we get started talking about your book, tell us a little bit about what you've been up to and also who are you? <laughs> Yeah, well, I teach uh, in Berkeley, California at the Graduate Theological Union, specifically at Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary. Just starting my eighth year here as a preaching professor and um, yeah, just really enjoying living in the beautiful Bay Area. I'm so jealous. I, <laughs> that's, that's where I grew up. So I know, I'm just, I know. any other preaching professor jobs open up there, let me know. <laughs> It's don't pretty, don't, it's don't let it wonderful. Yeah, it's December. Uh, it's winter, and um, I, I'm going to go play tennis a little later. Yeah, fantastic. Are you, are, you, are you up to any uh, any projects, current projects you've got going on, Shana? Yeah, actually, just uh, beginning the next book on uh, preaching and filmmaking. What preachers can. Uh, learn about the craft of filmmaking. So not religious themes or religious uh, content in films, but the, but the craft. Yeah. So co-authoring with a, with a filmmaker. Fun. Yeah. Good. That's fantastic. Yeah. Super exciting. I can't wait. So the people's sermon is, is a striking title. And throughout the book, you talk about proclamation as a shared experience rather than as a solo performance for preachers who are barely stringing it together week to week, uh, why should they consider doing something that may seem to take more time, effort, and planning? Very fair question. <laughs> Often the first question I get, and perhaps even the reason people might uh, look at the book and then put it down, but I hope they'll uh, get into it a little further to find that um, I think we're missing an opportunity if it's the time constraint that's uh, keeping us from, from this opportunity as a preaching as a shared opportunity. I wanna acknowledge the time restraints. I've been there, I am there. Even as a guest preacher uh, though, I don't, I have committed to not craft a sermon in isolation. And yes, it does take a, a little bit more time, um, but the time that it takes is ministry. Um, I so think talk I said about in, that. Talk about the basic idea. The basic idea is to um, involve other people in the process of crafting the sermon, to do Bible study around the lectionary text. Uh, and by Bible study, I don't mean I'm, as the preacher, I'm going to tell you what this scripture says, but to draw out of you how you're engaging it, and then to utilize that uh, wisdom that comes from the people to craft the sermon itself. And it might even be that uh, an illustration will come directly from that. So with permission, of course, I might utilize an illustration from somebody in the congregation or even pass the mic, invite them to be, to speak the illustration in the sermon. And then afterwards to get some feedback and not feedback that is um, on a scale of one to 10, how'd I do? But more like, uh, what did you hear according to this sermon, who is God? For whom does this sermon prompt you to pray? What questions do you have about the biblical story that you want to know more about? Who are you going to talk to about the sermon and what are you going to say and why? So it's about continuing the conversation. So I just want to say it's all of that, I think, is ministry. And if we're crafting a sermon in isolation, then we're missing opportunities for ministry. More time, yes, but it is ministry. It's worth the effort. You know, that matches, um, th that reinforces the basic idea that you're talking about reinforces uh, two things we learned years ago in a big study called the Vibrant, Con the Vibrant Congregation Study, where we had biblical preaching, Caroline was involved with that, congregations experimenting, and also 
biblical fluency. I was working on that. In both of those areas, we separately concluded that if you can get people to do a little work thinking about the text before they arrive in worship and arrive, complicated concept now, but just getting them even just to read it once or confirmation students to look at it on a Wednesday, people get more out of it, they said, if they engage the text in any way. So, I mean, uh, there is actually other data that supports your basic frame. Yeah, they listen differently. They come with a different kind of, of eagerness when we know just in life, when somebody is open to what we have to say, they invite us to speak and they actually really listen. And then they utilize that somehow that honors and respects people. And I, I think people sense that. I love the collaborative aspect of this, Shauna, and the way in which you're, you know, you're really, you're really committed then to a, a community of proclamation. Mm-hmm. And, and so it, it's a, it's a different kind of sense of a homiletic, right. And, and in terms of, because we've been so used to, of course, throughout our homiletical history of the idea of really a sermon as a monologue <laughs> and you are saying, no, it's a more of a dialogue and it's a, this ongoing conversation. And I think many preachers would, would find this really attractive and, and express a desire to do it, but don't know how to do it. So maybe talk a little bit more for our listeners about this concept that you have that's the front end of the process that you're suggesting of the feed forward, like how does it work and why? And, and then also maybe what's your favorite way to engage in feed forward. So yeah, sure. if you could share a little bit more about that, I love that. Yeah. Well, I mean, life with the people is feed forward. And so we yeah. know this, this really noticing and taking note of things. So it's, it's, it's happening. And I want to acknowledge that it's on the part of the pre- preacher, probably likely happening, but maybe the congregation hasn't been explicitly invited into that. Um, and so it could be something as simple as you're, you're going and doing your hospital visits or going to the, to the nursing homes. And as you're visiting, you say, hey, I'm working on this sermon on Luke 4. Can I, can I read this to you? Or let's, mm-hmm. let's read this. What, what do you think? And here we are at, in the hospital room, which is a different location. And so we're going to hear that differently. And that might be it. Or I might actually even say to Norma, who's sitting in the hospital room, hey, would you record a reading of this? And I take her voice with me. Um, I might even say, could you be the reader? Could I play this on Sunday and you be the reader? Wow. All of a sudden, people are hearing other people's voices. That is small. I don't think that would take more time to press record and ask for permission. And I also think pastors often, less often now I've heard, have a pastor's text study, but why are we not having a congregational uh, text study? And I think many people do. Then the thing that happens is though, 90% of the time the preacher is speaking at the people. 10% of the time, people are nodding or saying yes or asking a question. I want to flip that balance. That in a Bible study, the majority of time, the people are speaking. They're being equipped to to really, biblical fluency is it, Ralph. They're being equipped to engage scripture in a way that we've learned, but let's share it with them. Compare translations. Do a four-minute brainstorm from the perspective of that character. Write it down and then share it in a small group. Um, Imagine what this story would be like if you were somebody who's just recently uh, lost a job and you feel kind of aimless. What's it going to be like to hear this? And then you as the preacher hear where people are and what's important to them. I love activities like the godly play, I Wonder, I Notice where as you're reading scripture, people interrupt with things they wonder and notice, just on the spot brainstorming. Mm. Or I just described that literary exercise a bit, or a musical exercise, work with the musicians and say, if you were Handel and you were gonna compose a piece based on this scripture reading, what would be the key signature? When would there be a key change? What is 
what instrument depicts Jesus's voice? You don't have to compose it. I've had a student do that, but you don't <laughs> have to do that. But what would it sound like? That helps you with the pacing. The, 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 is it a minor key? How are people hearing this? So you can start small and there's, it's kind of endless really. And it's coll collaborative, it's creative. The other key is it's not just me as the preacher and you and Norma, that's a good thing. But when people start hearing one another, engage scripture like oh my goodness if robin can do that i can do that <laughs> you know oh i have an idea all of a sudden that biblical fluency starts to come and people feel like this story is my story too it's a friend and this friend actually wants to hear from me mm, i love that and and also like tapping into imagination and totally and it's less about it's less about finding the meaning of the text as we know but it's about what what is what is striking you here i uh rolf and i had the same internship site back in the day a long time ago yeah. and one of the really powerful aspects of preaching in that context was we did have a Wednesday morning Bible study, women's Bible study, and it was always on the text for Sunday. Mm -hmm. And, oh, just sitting around the table you know, early morning, 6.30 in the morning with a cup of coffee and pastries and listening to their, to their reactions to the text, inevitably something ended up in your sermon. And uh, so exactly. I, I just think that, and it also just gives people a, a real sense of, um, agency and that, that they're, what they think about this really matters. So I just, I love yeah. it. Yeah. I think it's true. I'd like to add that one thing that the, the pandemic has, has solidified. I've, I mean, I've said this for 10 years, but people are like, oh, people aren't going to show up for Bible study. That's the problem. It's actually okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because, well, I mean, maybe not, but I mean, you can have a Bible study on zoom or if not that send out on your Facebook page or your website, hey, take a picture of, go out on your phones, take a photograph of where you see people metaphorically washing another person's feet or something. Uh -huh. Send those photographs in as people come into church or on Zoom worship, you're with permission, of course, those photographs are, are scrolling. Right. And it's the community that has done this. Or... Um, you have people who can draw, draw the scene as people come into worship, you put them on the, on the narthex. So people will start to show up and go, Oh, that one's really good. We're going to be hearing about that today. Yeah. yeah. So just, yeah. I mean, there are other ways to do this than also the one hour Bible study yet. I think we can utilize that more as well. Yeah. You also talk about uh, embodiment uh, that, that, that dialogue, dialogical preaching is not just about your voice. <laughs> you know, we think about dialogue as voice, but you write uh, embodied participation of the gathered community has potential to expand the yeah. influence of the priesthood of all believers. So what types of embodiment do you have in mind when you're thinking? That's a about sentence this? written by somebody with a PhD, by the way. <laughs> What's that, Rob? I said that's a sentence written by somebody with a PhD. <laughs> It's, I mean, Which it's, is good. it's a good one, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So what, what do you, what do you have? What do you mean by that? What yeah. Well, by? for starters, I mean, in the Shema, it says we're to love the Lord, our God, but just our brains, right? Just our brains. We're only, <laughs> no, it's our whole beings, our nephesh, right? Everything that we are. And I, I think of preaching the process and the moment as an act of worship, I think if we kind of get our heads around that, that changes it. And if we think we worship God with our whole beings, um, why are we only kind of using our, why is it so cognitive? How is it more embodied? There's a kinesthetic learning. Mm -hmm. We learn things by doing things with our, with our body. Right. Mm -hmm. So it certainly our voice is a part of our, our body. And I, I propose this concept of just not earth shattering, but, I wish we'd live it out, kind of pass the mic. It's a very embodied thing. If, if in the middle of my sermon, one of my illustrations is from somebody who is an expert, let's say a musician. And instead of, you know, saying, I'm quoting this person, invite Martha up at that point. Tell us about yeah. what this means. 
that is an embodied something. Somebody is literally standing up and walking mm. and coming to the place that is typically reserved for me as the preacher, perhaps. Or it could be to evoke the community's voice. There are examples in, in the book, one pastor, it was important for me to include examples from others that this isn't just my ideal thought that's way out there. People are doing this and it's making a difference. And he just started to evoke people saying, peace be with you. And then he didn't have to do it anymore. They just started saying, peace be with you in, in the middle of this. And we know traditions that do that. But I think that's still just neck and above, right? So something like, uh, I have an example in there. I preached a sermon. I said, okay, on the count of three, get in a position that if somebody were to take a photograph of you, what, what, would, what would exhibit blessing? Mm. And of course, people, you know, I know a lot of people just look down at their feet because they're like, you don't see me, which is why I'm not going to do this. Um, you know, <laughs> I get it. But so you can be playful. And I did this one place, almost 100% of the 300 people there did something. They put their arms up, they put their hands on a person next to them. And it was on Psalm 63, bless the Lord. I, I will bless the Lord as long as I live. What did, oh. I thought God blesses us. What does it mean for us to bless the Lord? Well, it's when we, when we are in these kind of embodied positions with the community, with the person next to us, blessing them is blessing God. And they looked, I said, now look around, kind of sneak, keep in your pose. And they're like, oh my goodness. So they remember this. There's a, there's a memory connected to embodying and it can go from there some using a scripture tableau, inviting people up to kind of tap out the players and say, what? What position would you be in if you were the tax collector? Show yeah. us what that looks like to you. I've done that too. It's really fun. That's great. I've got some deep uh, Hebrew learning for you on that, uh, about embodiment and that word bless. Ah, that yeah. the word in Hebrew comes from the word for knee. So most literally you would translate it kneel. Ah. Right now, but we all grew up Protestant, Lutheran. I, I, uh, I think you grew up Lutheran. Yeah, uh, she is. You're Lutheran now. And uh, so we didn't do that stuff. That was what the Catholics did. They had the oh, we kneeled church. as Lutherans. Yeah, not not not, uh, not in Minnesota. Uh, no, but, in Minnesota. <laughs> yeah. We didn't have any kneelers in the church, but I think we can learn something from all of the uh, changing postures that like Catholics use in worship. Yeah. And uh because you're right. It, I mean, that word implies getting on your knees, literally, as part of your worship. Wow. So, wow. hey, Beautiful. one. Thank you. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, one thing: the preacher has to give up um, from if they're preaching from the standard lectionary to do this, which is you have to commit early in the week as to which text you're going to preach on. You know, some people like to wait till Friday and then like pick from the menu, you know, like sort of, oh, yeah, I might go with the psalm this week. But it's you do have to kind of commit. And that's a good thing, I think. Yeah, I think I think there are other things that the preacher gives up. And wow, what's that? <laughs> and I and, you know, I mean, I may have my pet ideas that I want to bring yeah. into the pulpit. And sometimes I just have to give that up because the people aren't there. And, but, but yeah, you're also saying, you know, um, give up this habit of procrastinating. Yeah. Give that up. I'm okay with encouraging preachers to, to give that up. I also think that you do have to plan ahead, but you can plan ahead in group, like a group, if, if you're using the narrative lectionary, or if some of the uh, revised common lectionary have stories that just are consecutive, Go ahead and do do it in a bunch. Do it ahead of time. Do it once a month and, and look ahead and then just kind of ask three people, can you be my partners for the next three weeks when I get specifically into this part of the story? Um, and so there are, other, there are lots of different ways to do that. There's some ideas in the book. I certainly didn't get all of them in there. And I think people are doing things that I want to know about that match this that I haven't even heard of yet. I've learned so much from people who've done this. So other people may have ideas 
that say, yeah, I had to give that up, but I gained this. Mm. Yeah. Well, fantastic. I can't wait to try uh, some of this uh, intentionally. Uh, it's a fantastic yeah. contribution. We also like to do on this podcast, Shauna, uh, to go bigger uh, outside of the book a little bit and just uh, hear from you as a preacher uh, and and some some practical or even inspirational kinds of ways that you you do this thing we call preaching. Yeah. Uh, and this is in part related to your book, but I, I really wanted to ask this question that you talk about in the second chapter, but it's, I want to hear from you that there are many examples of preaching in the Bible itself. Mm-hmm. And I think that's such an important concept that, that, that we can actually learn to be better preachers from the Bible. <laughs> and so what <laughs> biblical preachers uh, do you find most compelling and inspiring or foundational for your own, for your own preaching? What, what who yeah. are some of, who are some of your go-to biblical preachers that, that inspire you week in and week out? Great question. Um, I'll actually go to one preaching event itself for starters. And that is, I named it already, I think Luke four, uh-huh. when, when Jesus is in, in, in Nazareth, he, he opens the scroll and he, and he reads from Isaiah. I, this is so foundational for my own preaching, like even a theology of proclamation, like what is the objective here? Mm. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor, sent me to proclaim freedom from the prisoners. I mean, listen to this recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free. So, I mean, aim big. (laughs) This is no small thing. Mm. And that, I mean, of course, great answer, Jesus. (laughs) <laughs> but it's that particular event that is just, he's using scripture, proclaiming scripture, and something is happening. Mm. When God speaks, something happens. Believe it, aim big, do it. And then you have to find out what happened to you. Mm. So I love these stories where people like say, oh, well, what was that? And I'll just have to point to all the women in scripture who witness something and they know there's something there. They don't know quite what it is, or sometimes they do know what it is, but they dare to run back and tell somebody what they saw. Mm -hmm. They're witnessing it and then they're bearing witness. That is a theology of proclamation. I I think that's amazing. And so I want to find out from people, what have you seen? Mm -hmm. What, What engages you? What makes you curious? What just makes your world go on fire, right? And, and tell people about that, that, that those places in scripture are moving to me. Hmm. I also, it's very comforting with the Luke sermon that the, the response is to throw them off a cliff. So that always, <laughs> okay, there, <laughs> that always makes me feel actually, better. <laughs> yeah, right. There, there are those places. I think I did yeah. name that in some of those, right. But uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Good. Right, right. Yeah. And, and, uh, where would they throw him off, Caroline? You've been there. Uh, the Mount of Precipitation. Yes. Oh. <laughs> yes, yes. The, or the, the Mount Precipice. I like saying yeah. that word too. Uh, okay, here's another question, uh, Shauna, for, for you and for our listeners. What is the hardest sermon you've ever preached and how did you get through it? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so. I preached at all four of my grandparents' funerals and who knows if that's a good idea or not, but I was asked, I said, I I said, yes. And I'm glad that I did very much an an honor. In fact, in two, for two of them, I think I've been the only woman to preach in the Roman Catholic church in my hometown in Minnesota. Mm. Um, But for my one grandfather, of course, my understanding of, funeral preaching, it's very connected to baptismal promises. And, um, and of course, the liturgy in the in the Lutheran church connects that as well. So I, I crafted a sermon, of course, I'm super sad. It's my first grandparent to die. I grew up with all of my grandparents at Mm. times living within a few blocks. And so it was it was, I was grieving. 
but I thought I'm gonna connect this to the baptism, but not too many hours before the funeral, I decided to just double check with my grandma. Yeah, when was, where was grandpa baptized or when was he baptized? Um, she's like, I don't, I don't know that I ever knew that he was baptized. So somehow I had to redo a, a sermon and I don't have a, this was 20 years ago. I don't have a, I, I was on internship actually. So maybe not 20, I don't remember. But um, so he was a carpenter and I just decided to, I just crafted a sermon in my head on, you know, God creating us paying attention to us, loving us in the womb, crafting us with such care and love, and just really pointed to this, pointed to God who loved my grandpa. Mm. I did too. Mm. Yeah. That, but it was hard. It was yeah. hard. <laughs> you know, get your facts right, folks. <laughs> Don't make assumptions. That's right. Uh, our, our, I think one of our, uh, one of our preaching professors always said, Use illustrations, but check them. Make sure they're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, go ahead. Another part of the feed forward process is to kind of test some of the things in the sermon with somebody. How might this land or exactly what you said? If there is a kind of illustration, make sure. Double check Mm -hmm. your facts. Don't make assumptions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we all get stuck sometimes, uh, you know, hit the wall, run dry. Uh, yeah. what, uh, what, what are some of the things that you do uh, when you, uh, you know, run out of, you just run dry? Yeah. Hands down the most, the first thing I do is just go outside, start walking. Absolutely. Um, and then sometimes I, <clears throat> I separate from the computer screen, separate from the notebook, separate from anything like that. And I just, I, I kind of pretend in my brain, it's time. <laughs> the gospel acclamation, we just got done with the gospel acclamation, start preaching woman. And so I'll, I imagine, oh, there's Caroline in her usual pew. There's Rolf. I, as I'm walking, I imagine I push record on my phone and I go walking and I just start, if I had to preach this minute, given what I know so far, trust what you know. And I just start preaching 10, 15 minutes into my phone, come back, listen to it and listen to see if there was anything that just will stick. That's great. That's great. Never heard that one before. No, I love that. Yeah. I love that. Especially now that we have phones and we can do recording and Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's great. I, I also, oh, go ahead. Were you gonna oh, I was going to also add that, that um, I typically would do that. And, but that doesn't get me a hundred percent unstuck, but it gets me started. And I often find what I'm missing here is two things. I need to go back to the text, but I need mm. to go back to the text with someone mm. because I I'm too focused on my thing. I need to hear another voice. And so I'll look back at those creative and collaborative activities and say, who can I call to say, let me share this with you? Or, or will you tell me, tell me what you think about this story? I do some kind of exercise with somebody else. And that typically helps. It's somebody else who helps me along, nudges me along. That's great. Okay. Another question about your inspiration. What are, what are your go-to books when you need to you have a sense that you need to refill yourself spiritually. You need to, you know, fill the well back up, if you, if you will. What are some of those inspirational resources that you turn to? Yeah, any like written resources here at your one. Yeah, um, you know, I, I am a fan of short story fiction. Um, maybe short story just because back to that time element, but I, I just, I also think it suits what we do. I I don't preach for an hour, you know, it's, these are shorter bits here. So how do people get to a kind of narrative arc so quickly and draw me in so quickly? So I think becoming literate in short story fiction has really, um, has been inspirational for me. Plus I'm introduced to all these characters imagined or not, they could possibly be reflective of real people and real incidents. And there's a literature has been shown to develop empathy 
in, mm. in ways. So what are these, what are these kind of emotional intelligences and capacities that come from a, a deep study of literature and openness to, to what it offers? There's a distance between my life and the life of these characters that allows me space to, to be drawn in to whatever extent I feel capable in that moment. So for me, that that's inspiring. I love, I love Flannery O'Connor, mm. um, Alice Monroe. I, I'm really on to Alice Monroe these days, for sure. Yeah. The last thing we do in the podcast is uh, that our, our third co-host, uh, Bandit the Podcat, yeah. uh, asks some questions. Yeah. So Bandit asks, what is your favorite animal and why is it a cat? <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, I'm allergic to cats. I'm sorry. I, I oh, think they're wonderful beings. Um, you're I, crushing Bandit's heart. I, I know, but Bandit <laughs> will be happy to know that I am a Leo. So I'm in the, isn't a, a cat family a lion. So anyway, but uh, I don't, I don't, my favorite animal is, is, is not a species or a class. Sorry, I don't know the right genus, species, class. I don't remember, but one animal in particular, and that's my little toy poodle who's sitting right over there. That's my favorite animal. <laughs> awesome. And the name? Zoe. Okay. Which means life in Greek. Got me through right. the pandemic. And Aww. didn't you, didn't you um, dedicate? Maybe. Yes. Maybe yes. the book might be dedicated to Zoe. I just, ne I never thought I'd be the person to, to do that. But I wrote this when we were on, when we were in lockdown. That's when my sabbatical was. Of course, I dedicated yeah. it to students who, who and folks who'd, who are willing to try this on for size, but also Zoe was my companion. It was, she was my life. I never thought I'd be that kind of person, but I'm sold. <laughs> That's great. Awesome. Well, Bandit would also like to know, what is your favorite bird? My favorite bird is something like the heron. Mm. Man, they're so regal, aren't they? And then, like in a marsh, it's this like they just stand up so stiff, and then they move just so regally. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, huh. I love parents too. Uh, what's the strange bandit asks? Uh, what's the strangest place you've ever taken a nap? Ooh, I love a nap now. Um, uh, well, it was supposed to be a full night's sleep, but it only ended up being a nap. It was in a park in Pamplona, Spain during the running of the bulls one summer a long time ago. And we assumed there would be hotel rooms and um, we assumed we would have money left. This group of us traveling in Spain, nope. And here we're <laughs> stuck in this park and it was like 45 degrees and we didn't have jackets. And so we huddled together to keep each other warm, we took turns being on the, you know, being in the middle. So we were warmed. So that meant that really the night's sleep ended up just being a nap. Wow. That's great. All right. One last question from Bandit. Um, and he would like to know what food could you eat every single day? Uh, kumquats. Kumquats. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't see that coming. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Buy a kumquat. Oh my gosh. It's like a whole orange in one bite. It's just this burst of joy. There you go. I love it. I love it. Well, this book is going to I, inspire so many uh, people to rethink what it means to preach, why we preach, and what preaching can sound like and look like and feel like. I remember that you presented on this, uh, Shauna, at our Craft of Preaching event that we used to have. And I'm so thrilled that that presentation and, and what you were thinking about has turned into a really wonderful resource for working preachers. So thank you so much for being on our podcast. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And thanks for listening to this episode of Working Preacher Books podcast. Stay up to date on our conversation at workingpreacher.org. Follow us on Twitter or Facebook and find the latest in our Working Preacher Books series at workingpreacher.org slash books. Thanks for joining us.